everybody, it's Father David here, and I got Michael Gormley, our Director of Evangelization. We want to make a special video on the Sacrament of Anointing of the Sick. Everybody knows that if you are ever seriously ill, um, that you can call the office, and we can arrange a time for either the priest to come to you to do the sacraments of penance and anointing, and as well to receive the Most Holy Eucharist, or you can call us and we'll arrange something like that where you're maybe going to come to Mass, and we meet you before Mass, again, to hear your confession and to anoint you. Um, at the same time, Father Jesse, wanting to make that sacrament more available, to those. We're looking at having uh, something once a month where we have the, the Holy Mass and then with the sacrament of anointing of the sick within it. This is one of the rites that the church gives to us. So we want to come today and we want to talk more about this beautiful sacrament of anointing of the sick, which is very much misunderstood. Um, and so I invited Michael Gormley here again to, for us to talk about it, talk about like what it is, who would be able to receive it, as well what we need to do to prepare ourselves like for it. So Every sacrament has someone who ministers to it, someone who's a recipient of it, the matter, the form. It's all very important for the administration of the sacrament. The confusion, I bit my tongue when I said that. The, confu the confusion often comes in when we talk about the sacrament of anointing of the sick as to who can receive it. So we know who can give it, only bishops and priests. Only bishops and priests can give the sacrament of anointing of the sick. What happened was basically before Vatican II was called the sacrament, and it's still called this extreme unction, unction meaning anointing and extreme meaning the end, right? The final anointing, the last anointing. So what ended up happening is a lot of people thought anointing of the sick only pertains to when I am at death's door, something that we call last rites, right? This like, I am about to die. Therefore go call the priest run right now. The problem is the church wanted to broaden our understanding of the sacrament. So they renamed it anointing of the sick. But in so doing, a lot of people thought, oh, anytime I'm sick, I have an illness, the flu, whatever, I can get the anointing. No. So this is what we want to do. We want to talk about who can receive the anointing and who can't. Because once we understand it, we understand the power of the sacrament itself. Why do we need an anointing of the sick sacrament? Jesus Christ instituted the anointing of the sick sacrament because we, in our bodily frailty and infirmities, especially when we are in, the, in danger of death, just the reality of those sufferings and death can cause us great damage, great harm to our spiritual health. Uh, I don't know about y'all, but I'm sure you and your work and ministry, you've encountered people at death's door who are despairing who might be, maybe when they receive a terrible diagnosis, they're like, forget this, forget this. They even hate God, get angry at God. They reject the maybe a good virtuous life that they've lived up to that point. Christ wants the church to, be a, to accompany people at the moment when bodily infirmity, especially death, begins to pull away at someone's spiritual health. Yeah, so I would add there too, again, not only this is the church, but as well, Father Jesse it, trying to be in line with the church, saying like whenever it becomes, like whenever we have a notion of this dangerous illness or a serious illness, something that puts us again in danger of death, like now, I think the exact term is like now is, excuse me, the faithful begin to be in danger of death from sickness or old age, the fitting time for him to receive the sacrament has certainly already arrived. And so we want to make sure that again, this is, and this is why we're going yeah. to start like having a regular time where people can just know if I come to this mass, I, if I've, if I'm properly prepared and we're going to have other things that will come out in regards to how, how you'll, this is one of the videos on how you'll know if you're properly prepared, but as well places where you can sign up on the website so that you can receive the sacrament like earlier, not just at this end stage. And this is also because like, there are few and few priests. I mean, be praying for vocations of the priesthood. Um, but we, especially, um, if there's fewer priests, we want to make sure that you have grace, not just at the moment of your death, but way before, again, to endure the sufferings. One of the, the particular scripture passages that's there within the anointing is that like saying that uh, Christ talking about his yoke being easy and his burden is light. Like he wants you to be yoked to him so that when you are dragon, like he can drag you along, like he can be the strong shoulders that carry you. Um, and he wants to help you in the midst of the sickness and the suffering. So you have his life, divine life within you uh, to wrestle with the temptations and things like that that are there. And so this is why the church provides, again, the sacred oil that our bishop blesses so that we may again be anointed uh, uh, for this last part of life that we all must go through in some way, shape or form yeah. till we pass on to our Lord. And Christ himself says, only those who persevere to the end will be saved, right? So the church has a sacrament for what we call final perseverance. That's the whole point to build up the grace that you can draw on at these final and last moments. 
Who can receive the anointing? This is so important because it's confusing. Only those who through illness or old age are in danger of death. So when we talk about the last, uh, you know, the very final moments, what the church is trying to say is, okay, if you get a cancer diagnosis, now's the time. Don't wait till it's in stage four and you can't move or maybe you've gone unconscious. That's a part, you know, oftentimes they have to anoint unconscious people and there's a whole stipulation about that. But the idea is if you have grave or serious illness or you're, you're elderly and your state, maybe you don't even have a sickness, but you've just significantly weakened. Right. That is when the anointing of the sick is appropriate. Now, when you have children, this is where a lot of people, you know, your pastoral heart kind of like, ah, children who have not yet attained the age of reason, four years old, three years old, whatever, even if they have a serious grave illness, a cancer diagnosis, leukemia, whatever, they should not receive the anointing of the sick. You know why? Number one, they're sinless. They remember if they've been baptized, they're sinless. They've been baptized. Now, what do you do when you did for uh, a friend of yours who, who yeah, whose so, child? So yeah. when there's this, when they have not committed any personal sins yet, they're not, like what the church then suggests is that we actually bring them into the fullness of the church, like in the next sacrament of initiation. So I would confirm right. them. And every priest, according to our bishop and the church, like has the ability to confer in danger of death, the sacrament of confirmation. And so that's what I did for like one of our friends, like, I, I anointed her child because they were going in for a major surgery that was had high chances the child would die. So I want to make sure they were confirmed and they had received that grace. They weren't ready to receive the Eucharist yet because the same sort of thing, uh, it, the same sort of logic applies. Like we wouldn't let a little kid who didn't understand it was Jesus to receive the Eucharist. So in the same way, like if, they're, if they don't have any particular sins, like we, they don't receive this particular sacrament. No, they have another one for them. Again, the beautiful sacrament of confirmation. Again, to, to complete their, uh, um, that which was given to them in baptism. Yeah, so remember, it's not just those at the point of death but those who begin to be in serious danger of death. If a surgery is for a serious illness, come get the anointing before the surgery, right? So if you're going to have, you know, like cancer, you know, they're going to cut something out or you can do that. That's good to get before a serious surgery, life-threatening surgery, you can receive the anointing. Yeah, come to me, come to the priest. We're gonna, we want you to receive the sacrament of reconciliation while you still can to just dump, carve out all the junk out of your heart so you can have the full divine life through the sacrament of reconciliation and as well then be strengthened with the sacrament of anointing of the sick. Hmm. If it's something where you're, again, it's just an elective surgery or it's kind of like maybe something vain or something like that, like we're not going into the surgery because of a serious illness. Um, yeah, like when my son had his tonsils removed, right? That wasn't for a serious life-threatening reason. Mm -hmm. It was still a surgery. It was still scary for mom and dad. And I may or may not have cried the entire time. But what do you do in those cases? Yeah, you can come get blessing, right? There's a lot of prayers for the sick. There's a lot of prayers. Yeah. See, this is the thing that sometimes people do is they don't realize that the church has a treasury of things that we can give and do for people. Fasting and praying is a, a huge thing. But also another thing that people don't realize, like you said, sacrament. For a lot of the people that aren't eligible necessarily for the sacrament of anointing of the sick, such as the chronically ill, people think, well, I'm sick. Uh, it's a serious illness. It's like, yeah, but it's not putting you in danger of death. People can live for years with certain illnesses. So what do we do for the chronically ill? Well, we keep continue to pray for them, but also the sacraments of confession and the Eucharist. And the Eucharist. Right, that's, the that's what people thing. don't get is that the last rites, that's three different rites. It's three different sacraments. It's it's the sacrament of reconciliation, the sacrament of anointing the sick, and the Eucharist. The Eucharist, if anything, really is, it's the viaticum. It's the bread for the journey. It is God, like, again, giving you himself so that you can pass into the loving arms of the Father. Like, in an ideal world, like, everybody receives those three. But most of the time, when their life has come to an end, they typically are receiving the anointing of the sick. For everybody else, like, when you're, if it's like a chronic illness and one that isn't putting your life in danger, than sacrament of reconciliation and yeah. the most holy Eucharist. Jesus himself, body, blood, soul, and divinity is a bigger deal than this sacrament. Even though it's a sacrament and conveys like grace, Jesus is himself, uh, his real presence is bigger. The other thing is when we talk about mental illness and emotional illnesses, this sometimes can be a difficult topic. It's not just for every mental or emotional illness, right? We, we, many people in America struggle with anxiety and depression. It's when those push us to the extremes, the in danger of death stage. That's where it becomes necessary to do our sacramental work or rather the sacramental work of the, of the priest. Also, I want to say 
for those who have received the anointing of the sick and then your condition worsens, you should ask for the anointing again. Also, we want to talk about, uh, and this is interesting, soldiers and police and first responders who are going into a situation where their lives are going to be active, you know, shootings and, and uh, you know, wartime and all that stuff. They don't, they don't need the anointing of the sick, even though they're going to be in danger of death. Oh, why? Because the best thing for them is confession and the Eucharist, yes. right? That's not what the anointing is for. It's for bodily infirmity. So just to recap, number one, it's only for those who are seriously ill, that is, you've begun to be in danger of death, or your old age has caused you to be seriously weakened, right? So your condition has worsened. Number two, you are of the age of reason. So you have to be of the age of reason, the age of discretion. Usually we say seven-year-old, but that can be any kid who can understand the difference between right and wrong. I can know the difference between the Eucharistic bread and ordinary bread, right? So things like that. Let's talk about people who shouldn't. So obviously we already said children who are before the age of reason, but they're already baptized shouldn't. Mm -hmm. Like they're, they're good. Elderly who's old age, like maybe, yes, you, you have your AARP card, uh, but you're, you're still living your you're best great. life, right? Yeah, you don't need to receive the anointing of the sick. Just because you're old, that doesn't mean you're sick. Yeah, reconciliation Eucharist. Reconciliation yeah. Eucharist. Those are the big ones. People who are in chronic illness, that it's not putting them in danger of death, or who have disabilities that aren't putting them in danger of death. We don't want to group all of these things in the same category. This is where our bodily weakness is putting us in danger of death, so we need that grace of final perseverance. The last thing I want to point out are those who, because their state or condition in life just makes them invalid to receive any sacrament. Number one, people who are in invalid marriages, right? If you're not married in the Catholic Church, if it is not a sacramental marriage, whether that's a convalidation or radical sanation, some of these things that happen after the fact, or you didn't get married at all in the Catholic Church, you can't receive this. And the only exception to this is if you are on death's door in, in extreme danger of death and you say, if I get better, I will resolve my marriage impediments, yeah. right? So that's the only way the priest is allowed to administer to this to you. And then finally, those who are non-Christian, right? If you're unbaptized, you should be encouraged to get baptized, yeah. right? Not the anointing of the sick. Or if you're a Protestant Christian, the church would make one exception. That's you're in the danger of death. And you have no access to your minister and your faith, and you and you respond with a Catholic faith. You say, "Yes, I want this sacrament because I believe the Catholic Church, you know, is 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 the Church Christ started." But when you start to look at these things, it makes sense because every sacrament not only has objective and subjective, but has those for whom the sacrament is made. And so who is eligible? A lot of people are like, "Well, that's cruel. You're not giving this." No, no, no. This isn't just to bless people and hope that they get. Well, that's what healings and prayer blessings and Misa Pro Infirm, a Mass for the Sick, all that stuff can do that. But the anointing is for those in danger of death whose bodily infirmities or old age or sickness has leading them to death's door. And they need the grace and virtue of the church to accompany them to the judgment seat of Christ in wholeness. That's what we want to be able to do. We hope that this can bring a little bit of clarity to the anointing of the sick to understanding why we have it, who is eligible to receive it, and especially when we do our communal services of anointing of the sick, where we have the Holy Mass and the rite of anointing of the sick within it, that the right people avail themselves of the sacrament. We are just giving it away, and we want to give it to you if you need it. So hopefully, again, this video helped. Be watching on the website, and we'll have more information to help you discern if this sacrament is right for you. God bless you. God love you. St. Anthony of Padua. Pray for us.